So this is why I say start with the gut and then many times other things downstream to that will correct themselves. What symptoms that many people have on a regular basis really informs us that we have an actual issue here that needs to be like treated. You have bloating, gas, distension, discomfort, pain, loose bowels or diarrhea, constipation, reflux. Today's guest is Dr. Michael Ruscio, an integrative medicine clinician who focuses on gut health. We discuss how gut health impacts our cognitive function, our hormones, our energy, and even sleep. And we dive into the science of optimum nutrition for gut health, best types of probiotics, and so much more. One study found about 20% of the population has a fungal overgrowth, irritable bowel syndrome. That's 15%, maybe 20% of the population. This is how we see connections between I'm bloated and I feel foggy and tired, or I have loose bowels and I'm not sleeping well. Dr. Michael Ruscio, welcome to the podcast, my friend. We're so happy to have you here. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So this is a privilege for us and our fit father and fit mother communities to be able to speak with you as one of the leading experts in gut and digestive health. And you've been paving the way for many years in making this whole gut connection to our major organs, our thyroid, our cognitive health. So what I want to get into today is to help people understand the how fundamental gut health is to the rest of the body. I want to get into some practical tips of stuff people can do nutritionally with maybe certain foods, right. supplements, and when they're indicated, um, and just make it a, a very deep conversation. And I want to kick this off with uh, a famous quote from Hippocrates, the ancient Greek physician. He says, all disease begins in the gut. And he said that like 2000 years ago. So that's wild that we had that understanding, you know, back then. And it's right. only been, you know, really the last, I feel like 30, 40, 50 years where we've been got really deep in this gut health connection. So how did this become so apparent to you? And why did you build a whole career around understanding <laughs> gut health and helping people fix it? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of a painful story where when I was in college, I went from college athlete playing the cross, you know, when you're in your early twenties, you feel almost invincible right? You can stay up late. You can work all day, academics all day, crush a good workout. And then all of a sudden I started having fatigue, brain fog, and this was a food reactive brain fog. So I'd be feeling pretty good. I'd eat. And then all of a sudden for three hours, I'd feel foggy and tired. So kind of tying in Hippocrates' early observations. Uh, I was having low mood, but I was doing all the things. And I know you do an awesome job with your audience about sleep and lifestyle and, and sort of slowing down. So all organic food, chewing my food thoroughly, but still I went from feeling really healthy to quite poorly in the matter of just a few months. And I went and saw a few doctors, a few conventional doctors, and they were all well-intentioned and wanted to help, but they said, yeah, you know, you're probably just stressed, you know, the platitudes you get, you're probably just stressed or what have you, just try relaxing a little bit more. And I found my way into alternative medicine and a clinician suggested that he thought I had an inflammatory or infectious issue in my GI. And it turns out I did, I picked up a critter and it, it's an, it was an amoeba which can be quite pathogenic. And it was causing major problems with how I digest and assimilate food and a local inflammatory response in the intestines. And boy, if I didn't address that, I don't know where I'd be today. I'd probably be struggling with depression, various antidepressants, fatigue, cravings, low mood. And so then I, I took that experience and diverted my path into helping other people with the same thing I was suffering with, which was feeling like I was doing all the things but still hitting this roadblock of just not feeling like myself. And for me, the, the linchpin there was really improving the health of my gut. Hmm. That's and where do you think I just out of curiosity, you picked up that amoeba, like where did, what, do you know, have any idea of the cause of that? No, you know, that's what was interesting about my history and also very informative. Didn't go to Mexico, right? Have food poisoning. And then after that felt poorly, I think what happened in my case is I was running a little bit too hot a little bit too hard. I was in a rigorous academic program. I also had started my own side business and I was just going, 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 very type A, enjoyed working hard, enjoyed the feeling of working hard. And I think over time that just weakened my immune system. And so it was not so much the germ, but the terrain. And we see this in athletes, right? Um, athletes after a big race oftentimes will have increased viral load, increased bacterial load. 
and so it, it's definitely something to cue in on is if someone's running too hard and they're not allowing adequate recovery, then their shield go down in a way. And these things that normally just pass through, because there, there's always these things in the environment that are trying to kind of establish residency in us because we're a convenient host, right? We provide food, shelter, and water. But if the shields go down, they can take up residence. And that's when you just need some help to kind of dislodge that imbalance and get back to normal. That's a huge point. And, and I know I found that too, when I was competitive bodybuilding, when I was pushing really hard or trying to diet really hard for a competition, that's when I would be more susceptible to upper, upper respiratory infections. And it's just like, yeah, I, I love that concept. And I think that's really important that it's, it's really as much about if but more so about the terrain than it is, you know, any kind of specific pathogen. And I think current Western allopathic medicine has kind of been so far on the other side of things. We're looking at everything as pathogenic and problematic. And that's why we have such heavy antibiotic use, which I kind of want to segue into. Like, do you see that as a, as a massive problem? Like what, what's the landscape of how we've been using antibiotics and how that kind of affects population health and maybe even individual case studies and people you've had in your practice? Yeah, it's definitely one component of sort of this mosaic in the Western lifestyle that's not conducive to health. Stress, poor sleep, poor food choices, antibiotic use, perhaps people were not vaginally birthed and instead were cesarean birthed, and that's your first sort of inoculation of good bacteria for a mom. Maybe they weren't breastfed, they were bottle fed, so that's even more of a loss opportunity to develop those healthy microbes in the gut that police out the bad things from being able to take up residence or imbalance. So yeah, all these things collectively um, have really set the stage for people in westernized societies to have more issues in the gut. And, and when we look at some stats, because it is important, you know, to sort of take the philosophy and then fact check it against science. And this is how we kind of weave back and forth to, to get rid of any incorrect philosophies in our perspective. But if you look at irritable bowel syndrome, that's 15%, maybe 20% of the population. One study found about 20% of the population has a fungal overgrowth. Uh, women in their reproductive years, 75% of them will have vaginal candida at some point. Now, one bout isn't a huge deal, but if there's been recurring bouts of candida or fungal overgrowth, then all these things start to paint the picture that something in the GI is is sort of out of whack. So yeah, antibiotics are, are definitely one of a few things that are not really putting us in a very strong position. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you expanded that out to that that bigger picture there. So take us through, like, we, we have these terms that I think some people listening are familiar with that not all are. So probiotics, prebiotics, hmm. gut microbiome. Take me through, like, what my digestive tract is from maybe, like, mouth all the way down and, and give me a little primer on, you know, what the landscape actually looks like, what functions happen when I say digestive tract or GI tract or these sure. kinds of terms that are thrown around so we, we have good context for the rest of this conversation. Sure. I'll do a broad overview and then I'll double click on one area that I think is the most important. Digestion yeah. starts in the mouth. From there, you go to the throat, stomach. Stomach is where you release acid. This really starts the digestive process. Some people have insufficient acid as one example, and that sort of poses a risk down the line. From the stomach, you go into the small intestine. The small intestine is 22 feet in length. It's really important because this is where 95% of calories and nutrients are absorbed. Then you go to the large intestine, you pull out some salt and some water, rectum, and then you pass your bowels. The key part here, uh, and pardon my excitement, but it's just, it's just so important, is the small intestine, 22 feet in length, whereas the large intestine is only five feet in length. Now mm -hmm. in that 20 or yeah, that, that 22 feet, again, 95% of calories and nutrients are absorbed, but also because it's so absorptive, you have a lot of immune cells. In fact, 70% plus of the immune cells in your entire body is there in the small intestine. And what happens is if the gut is not functioning in a healthy fashion, things leak through. And now the immune system reacts with inflammation. And that inflammation can go systemic. And this is how we see connections between I'm bloated and I feel foggy and tired, or I have mm -hmm. loose bowels and I'm not sleeping well, or I'm constipated and I have skin breakouts. 
and it's, it's this component that if we get this right, it's, it's such a win in the sense that people absorb nutrients better, but they also have less inflammation. And that can really correct a myriad of things from the brain to the adrenal glands, to sexual function, to skin, to, and, uh, and to joints. Mm -hmm. That's, that's really important for people to understand and, and really well explained. And I, I heard this before, and I've said this before, and I think it's kind of interesting. Like you can almost think of your digestive tract as like outside of the body in a sense that you could almost like put a piece of string and rope and like, you could like right. floss yourself from your mouth <laughs> to your butt. Like it's a full right. tube that then stuff needs to actually be broken down and assimilate through these, um, these tight junctions in the small cells and in, in the small intestine to kind of get into the actual circulation. So it's, it makes so much sense how that would be lined with all of our immune defenses where all this action happens. It's like the interface between the outside world, if you will, and the inside world. So important. So how would someone know, I mean, what, what are some, so you, you mentioned some of them, but like, how would someone start to get a sense if they have issues here? Like, what if someone feels like just generally like, okay, like they eat sometimes they feel a little bloated, they have yeah. occasional constipation, like what symptoms do people have that many people have on a regular basis really informs us that we have an actual issue here that needs to be like treated and, sure. or what kind of testing can people run to start to get more clear on if something's going on that needs to be looked at? Sure. There's two categories. One would be to be expected digestive. You have bloating, gas, distension, discomfort, pain, loose bowels or diarrhea, constipation, reflux. All these are obvious flags that there's something going on in the gut. Now, every once in a while, okay, we're human, right? No one's going to feel perfect all the time. So if it's once or twice a month, you feel a little funky, or maybe you had a really big meal with some drinks or spicy food. Okay. You know, a little bit of feeling there, a little bit of symptomatology, not a huge deal, but if it's happening on a weekly basis or a daily basis, definitely something to cue in on. The other that's sneaky is when there's not much in the way of digestive symptoms, but you're seeing things like, I feel tired in the middle of the day. I don't sleep well. I have fogginess. I uh, have joint pain that kind of comes and goes. I have these skin breakouts that, you know, that they kind of come and they go. I'm not sure. Maybe some foods trigger them and, and especially for noticing food reactivity. Uh, but one of the important concepts I learned way back when I had my issues, I had no real digestive symptoms. I didn't have loose bowels. I didn't have pain. For me, it was all neurological. I was tired and I was depressed and I wasn't sleeping well. And that was the huge sort of aha for me because sort of in, in sort of the uh, conventional textbooks, you're gonna see, well, if you have IBS, it's diarrhea, and it's, it's very sort of in the box, this cluster of just GI symptoms. Modern research is starting to show the connection between the gut and non-gut symptoms, like in a model of what's known as silent celiac. This is a full-blown autoimmune reaction to things like gluten. But for some people, they only have neurological or joint symptoms. So it's a pretty wide swath of symptoms that could indicate there's a problem in the gut. The way I would recommend your audience thinks about this is kind of like me. If you're doing everything right and you still have symptoms, I think the first place to look is to your gut as a potential culprit. And just to tie one thing to this, because I'm sure your audience has heard about the adrenals and cortisol. It's been documented that if you correct an imbalance in the gut, the cortisol output fixes itself. So this is why I say start with the gut and then many times other things downstream to that will correct themselves. Yeah. And then I guess like if you do have inflammation, I think it, it could be a number of things, right? One, you could have a, a pathogen or an overgrowth or a dysbiosis like you effectively had. Two, people could be eating foods that are just straight up not working for them that are just generally inflammatory. So like, what's the process of like untangling this? Is there a particular kind of like protocol or nutrition that you start to clean people up on or start to use kind of to help people get clear on what the underlying causes are? Two thoughts here. One, if people wanted a simple technique to try to get some gut rest, because rest sometimes is all you need. If you sprained your ankle, 
the ankle would heal if you just took some time off of running or sprinting or weightlifting or whatever. So a simple concept would be something like a fast or a modified fast. Too much fasting can obviously be a problem because then people will start not sleeping well and, and being undernourished. We also like using an elemental diet. Picture a complete meal replacement like a protein shake that's hypoallergenic and pre-digested. So people can do one, two, three days on these liquid shakes, and that just gives the gut a rest. So that's a simple way of, okay, I'm busy. I don't have a lot of bandwidth for thinking about different diets or changing much. Okay, just do a liquid diet for a couple of days. It's super easy. Make a shake in a blender, and that can be enough to give people a bump in some cases. Beyond that, then I start looking at these two gut types. Are you a bacterial type or a fungal type? And this is because we have both of these organisms in our gut, but depending on what population overgrows, you see a different presentation. The bacterial types, they have too much bacteria. They can be good, but when there's too much, they can be problematic. And these are the people who may say, gosh, the better I eat, the worse I feel. I eat lots of fruits and vegetables and fibers. I have asparagus and broccoli and big salads. And oh, I just feel bloated. My bowels are loose. And along with that, maybe I feel kind of foggy and tired. Why is that? Well, all those seemingly healthy, and they are healthy, high fiber foods can be feeding the actual problem in those cases. They already have too much bacteria. The shields kind of went down. The bacterial populations went up. And now some of these, again, otherwise healthy foods like broccoli or avocado are making that problem worse. Now, conversely, there's also the fungal types. These people will notice if I have too much potato, rice, fruit, starches, carbs, sweets, that's when I flare. They may do fine on lots of vegetables and sort of like a lower carb approach, but carbs and starches and sweets really flare them. And these are the people who also may notice a white tongue, kind of rashing in the armpit, vaginal candida, jock itch, toenail fungus. And knowing that can give you the, okay, we're going to go in one of two dietary directions as kind of a temporary rehab plan. Eventually, we want to get you back to a broad, healthy diet, which is what I really appreciate about your approach. You're not dogmatic on like one diet plan. You, you got to be vegan. You got to be carnivore. You got to be low carb, but rather let's find the rehab diet that's going to get that ankle healthy and then get you back to healthy activity or get you back to sort of a broad omnivorous diet that appeals to you. I love that framework. It's really exciting. Just a nice way to think about it. And I would love to kind of give some, give me some examples in both of those categories. So maybe we start with the fungal type first, which many people have heard this as like candida being a main fungus, but I'm sure there's other ones that people could have overgrowth of. And so if someone feels like they have the white tongue, they feel bloated, they eat sugar, they feel digestive symptoms or other symptoms, what would be like a remediating or rehabbing diet for a person in that category? And we do have some resources here. If people wanted to double click on more specifics. We have a self-assessment questionnaire that will give you a scorable list. So depending on how many things you say yes to, you get a quantification of low risk, medium risk, or high risk for a candida. And then a candida diet. Now, one of the challenges that people go online and, and they search candida diet, <laughs> there's always heretics out there who want you to go to an extreme dietarily. And this can be a problem because while carbs can be a problem, if you go too low carb, especially women, they may notice they have low energy. They don't sleep well. Their hair starts to thin. So it's just more so about looking at the carbs that aren't super rich in sugars and starches so that you don't feed the candida, which is the main organism that overgrows. But practically what this is looking like is instead of white rice, you have brown rice. Instead of lots of white potato, let's say as chips, you have sweet potato. Instead of banana and mango, high sugar fruits, you have berries. So some of these little shifts in the diet can steer you away from a much more carb and starch rich diet. And obviously things like cakes and sweets are definitely a no-no for this group. And focusing on more of the, the lower glycemic index or lower glycemic load carbohydrates at least for a term. And I should mention that diet is really powerful here. There was one study that gave people 
either an antifungal drug or the drug plus diet. The people that combined the drug with diet had twice the clearance rate of candida, twice. So, you know, sometimes people think, oh, like I got fungus, I need to zap it out. Maybe, right? But we can't uh, overlook how pivotal diet is in helping to assist the microbiome in getting back to balance. That's awesome. And now on the, on the bacterial side, which I remember you mentioning, if people are eating a lot of vegetables and fibrous vegetables uh, with that prebiotic fiber in them, typically, then they feel right. like bloated or overgrown. Like what's the approach on that side of things? Yeah. And this is, this is one that it's so, um, I guess just empowering to help people when, you know, when they come in, they'll say, doc, I feel like I'm doing everything right yet. I'm, you know, I'm still having all this bloating and food reactivity and loose bowels or constipation. And just a little pivot here can unlock so much healing and so much improvement. The main dietary change would be what's known as low FODMAP, F-O-D-M-A-P. It stands for fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. That just means the carb structure is either going to be really conducive to feeding bacteria, and if it is, we want to avoid those or not very conducive to feeding bacteria, not high in prebiotics. So a couple examples there, high FODMAP foods to be avoided, high prebiotic foods to be avoided would be broccoli, asparagus, cauliflower, but rather you should focus on spring mix, kale, uh, thing, you know, berries, another good example, uh, whereas apples are kind of high FODMAP. Uh, and we have food lists available. There's a great app from the University of Monash who's pioneering a lot of the research here. And zooming out, if either one of these diets, either the candida diet or the low FODMAP diet, are the right fit for someone's gut, you're looking at one, maybe two weeks before you clearly see improvement. And that's the really nice thing about this is it doesn't take a long time to know if, you know, hey, I'm on the right track or maybe I'm not and we should pivot. Mm hmm. And that's, I think, a really important point you brought up. It's like you're not saying these are the diets that people should follow. It's that we need to take ownership and be experimental with our own bodies to figure out what actually works and test these things out. Right. And and see how symptoms change. And then we kind of weave it in. Like I'll just reflect in my life. I, I do recognize that there's just certain vegetables that I eat where I feel bloated and, and not as good. Um, but I wouldn't say I necessarily follow low FODMAP because I'm eating a lot of like uh, jicama, asparagus, and some of these very heavy, uh, like green tip bananas, like these are all heavy mm -hmm. prebiotic foods, which work with me great. And I feel better when I have them. It's just certain foods won't feel good for certain people. And then at certain times as we get healthier. Um, so I think that's an important point for sure. I want to ask you about like probiotic supplements. Like what is your stance on people taking probiotic supplements? When are they appropriate? Do people who are getting healthy, should they take them? people who are like good and standard, like there's someone listening to this being like, you know, I want to optimize all areas of my health, but I'm pooping regularly. I don't feel too much bloating. Like, do I need a, a probiotic supplement too? Yeah. Great question. If you had asked me this two years ago, I would have said healthy people don't need a supplemental probiotic. Over the past one or two years, there have been a few studies that have suggested otherwise. One study in nurses who are otherwise healthy, but they found the nurses had better mood and better stress tolerance when they took a supplemental probiotic. A different study found higher levels of the master antioxidant, as it's known, glutathione, in healthy people who took an antioxidant. So I wouldn't say that healthy people, quote unquote, need a probiotic, but they may get some benefit from it. Certainly, someone who has the symptoms of IBS, altered bowels, gas, bloating, loose bowels, constipation, maybe reflux, yes. I should also mention that you can get sufficient probiotics from foods. So I would start with things like fermented foods. And there was a study from just a couple of years back, Stanford researchers published in Cell. They compared a high fiber diet to a high fermented food diet. And they actually found that the high fermented food diet was better for gut microbiota diversity. So the, the life of flora, and it was better at lowering inflammation. So there's so much buzz on the internet about fiber, 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 and that's all fine and good, but we shouldn't overlook how important fermented foods and the probiotics therein can be for improving someone's gut health. So things like sauerkraut, kimchi, kombucha, 
be a little careful because a lot of those have quite a bit of sugar. Um, but nevertheless, things like yogurt and kefir, those fermented foods are a great place to start. Which ones do you use regularly? Like what, for, what fermented foods are staples of your diet and also prebiotic fiber if you try to get those in as well? Yeah, I, I actually really like making a salad with spring mix and I'll add a fresh squeezed lemon to it and then mm -hmm. one or two scoops of sauerkraut and then one or mm -hmm. two scoops of beet kraut. So that gives you nice. some of the reds coming back to, uh, oh, we didn't hit on this yet. So the, the polyphenols, the antioxidants in foods, eating the rainbow, different colors will give you various antioxidants. So the beet kraut made from beets gives you a different antioxidant profile. It also gives you the probiotics and beets are also helpful for circulation and creating nitric oxide. So that's mm -hmm. been a go-to for me. Plus I really like a good yogurt and sometimes I'll do kimchi. Kimchi is the highest in prebiotics. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. probiotics. So the most potent yeah. would be, would be kimchi. Nice. Yeah. And I, and I recommend this to people is like, you, you should have your best in slot fermented food that you have regularly. Mine is, mine is sauerkraut that I have a lot of, um, sometimes kimchi as well, but it's cool to know that you make the salad. I make a similar salad. That's just, that's just fun. I, I love hearing that. Um, and something I've heard you talk about before is like different types of probiotics. And I think right now there's just so many different types of probiotic strains that you could take. What is your thought on this? Like what's some right. categories and how can we wrap our, our heads around what types of probiotic supplements are really solid? Yeah, it's a great question. And we're currently working on a scientific paper uh, to publish in a medical journal to help give doctors and, and um, delay people just some, some guidelines for simplifying use. The perspective we've taken is sort of a big picture or a meta perspective on probiotics. If you look at the hundreds of randomized control trials, you see that the probiotics used tend to break down into one of three types. You have your traditional. We've probably all heard of lactobacillus or bifidobacterium. That's your sort of OG classical probiotic, well-studied and effective. And when you look on the label, you'll see anywhere from five to maybe 12 different lactobacillus acidophilus, bifidobacterium infantis. So that's one type of probiotic. In my view, the nuances of the formula don't matter. That's going to get you a good quality, as long as it's a quality formula, that's going to cover your bases and work well for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Second to that, there's actually a healthy fungus. Um, Saccharomyces, and there's, there's two sort of species, Saccharomyces boulardii. People may have heard of Florastor, a really popular commercial probiotic. That's Saccharomyces boulardii. And there's also Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Two different types of fungus, well-studied, very helpful. That's what we call the second type of probiotic. And then the third are soil-based probiotics. These are things that are occurring or trying to replicate what we get when we have contact with the dirt, hence soil-based. And here we're looking at various bacillus species, bacillus subtilis, bacillus clausii, bacillus lichenformis. So if you look in the label, you'll see these bacillus. Why this is helpful is it gives a structure to your point, the consumer just sees the product name, right? Gut heal seven, healthy Trinity, you know, whatever, whatever it is. And they don't have a framework for looking at the ingredients and saying, oh, this is a Saccharomyces probiotic. This is a mm -hmm. lactobacillus and bifidobacterium probiotic, or this is a soil based probiotic. All of these I think are justifiable. A recent meta-analysis from Alex Ford at the University of Leeds did find that some species of the soil-based or bacillus are helpful, some of the saccharomyces are helpful, and some of the lactobacillus and bifidobacterium are helpful. So even with the most scrupulous scientific analysis via a meta-analysis, we see any one of these types works. So you can start with any one of these, give yourself a few weeks to determine if, you know, if it's helpful or not. We've gone one step further in some cases, because we'll see a lot of people who have gone through many different diet interventions, worked with providers. And in those cases, we'll essentially have them use all three bottles of the different probiotics in synergy. And this hasn't been published yet, but we've noticed that it tends to be more effective than using one probiotic alone. And you see this in other areas of medicine, not that I'm condoning this, but sometimes two antibiotics are used instead of one, or two high blood pressure meds are used instead of one to give you more oomph. We're just doing that same thing, but with a natural agent of supplemental probiotics. 
Nice. I love that. That's a really great breakdown. And I definitely feel more clear about that as well. And I was looking at a list that you had here. Well, something interesting is like the, the Saccharomyces, like that is found in the kefir too, or at least a, the Cerveciae oh, yeah. type of that, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Sir, yeah, and we have yeah, a comparison cool. video that we took probiotic supplements and laid them out next to probiotic foods and just gave you the dose comparison. And it was actually illuminating for me because I had previously thought yeah, you, you can't get the dose you need of probiotics unless you use a supplement, probably because of a lot of the supplement industry influence on how doctors and clinicians think. But when you put the data in a data table, you see, boy, the supplements and the foods have a very similar constituent of probiotics and the doses therein. That's cool. So I think both, so bo both strategies seem really great. Now, I want to talk about some foods that generally just kind of like wreck people or stuff to avoid. <laughs> Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very privy to all of the glyphosate, which is a common pesticide roundup that's sprayed on wheat. And I've, I've heard that that can really damage the gut microbiome. Um, and what's interesting, especially about like the wheat aspect, a lot of people super avoid wheat because they feel like I'm gluten, you know, in, uh, yeah. sensitive to gluten, let alone right. full blown celiac. What I can speak to in my personal experience is most bread that I eat would cause bloating and gas, but I make my own sprouted um ancient wheat from einkorn i take einkorn seed it's a it's a much simpler wheat simpler genetics it's organic i sprout it and i make my own like bread or crackers i eat those i feel phenomenal like right. like absolutely beneficial and it has gluten it has just a different type of gluten protein so right. i guess i, I just want to open the gates here about like which foods you know, are we talking non-organic wheat, just like most people should avoid um, that wreck the gut health? And then please do discuss the whole wheat thing and maybe some other foods that you think are problematic. I do think it's a good general strategy to opt for organic when possible. I don't think people have to be super scrupulous about that, especially trying to be sensitive to some people who are on a budget. I'd rather have someone eat whole food that's conventional than organic food that's processed. Yeah. And I'll give you one quick example. Blueberries are part of that dirty dozen, the most pesticide-laden 12 foods. Yet, meta-analyses summarizing multiple clinical trials using conventional pesticide-containing blueberries have found that a high consumption of blueberries improves cognitive function. So we wanna be a little careful, right, not to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Would organic blueberries be better? Yes, but I'd rather someone have blueberries than something processed that's organic. I'm so glad you raised the point about gluten because there's, I, I think there's some truth here and then there's some, there's a lot of confusion. One of the things that's come onto my radar screen more of late is that wheat, rye, and barley, the main gluten containing grains, they are also high FODMAP, so high prebiotic. I think this explains why so many people when they go gluten-free notice they feel better. Now the prevalence of non-celiac gluten reactivity, it's known as NCGS, non-celiac gluten sensitive. Studies vary, but it's anywhere from 1%, maybe to 10% of the population, probably around five. So that is something. But the thing here that I think is really important to bear in mind is that when people go gluten-free, they're also going to reduce FODMAPs, and that's probably accounting for, I think, the majority of why people feel well. Why does that matter? Because FODMAP tolerance is recoverable. So the huge gift here for people is you can go on sort of that rehab low FODMAP diet as your microbiome balances, as that overgrowth theoretically corrects, you should be able to bring back in some gluten and tolerate it better. Save maybe that 5% of people who have an allergy to the protein, those people will probably never do well with gluten, but that's probably a smaller cohort and the larger cohort it's just that the, the wheat, the rye, and the barley is feeding that overgrowth. If we can correct that, if nothing else, even if you don't think gluten is a, is a healthy food, you can be at a dinner and try the pasta or have some bread. And if nothing else, regain some of that food freedom that maybe you do have some tolerance to gluten that you didn't otherwise appreciate before. Nice. And, and this is anecdotal stuff, but what about the stories where people are like, man, our family went to vacation over in Europe. We ate the bread in Italy or the pasta and I felt fine. 
Like, what do you make of those kind of stories? Are they strictly anecdotes? Is there some basis to this? And I'm kind of getting back to, is there a pesticide thing? Is it, is it like different genetics of the wheat that people are eating that might be problematic? Because they I'm would technically sure, yeah. have the same similar FODMAP profiles, I would imagine, just in the nature of being wheat, barley, et cetera. Well, I'm going to make a few assumptions here, and this is on our list to research. I try to be really careful about what I've fact-checked firsthand and what is more anecdote. So here, just anecdote. Again, it is on our list to sort of rigorously fact-check this, but I'm assuming that the processing, you know, there's more processing, there's more probably additives, less fiber. That's probably one component, and the pesticides could be another I'm just, I'm not sure. So maybe, but the other thing that bear in mind with that is if people are going to Europe, they may be under less stress, spending more time with friends and family. Sure. They may have had an opportunity to reintroduce with a healthier gut after avoiding gluten for a while, regaining that mm. balance. And now they have FODMAP tolerance. So they may have just discovered right. that it was the FODMAPs. There, there do seem to be some people who have really tested this and said, well, when I came back to the U.S., I tried gluten again and you know I, I was okay in Italy, but I wasn't okay here. So I do think there's something more here and I'm not quite sure what the answer is just yet. That's a, that's a very fair answer. I appreciate that. Now, what about, um, what about artificial sweeteners? You know, I think there's a lot of people that were first like, oh, you know, calories are all that matter. It's not a big deal if you have sucralose, aspartame in your in your drinks. And now I think I've seen stuff come out in certainly headlines that's like you have artificial sweeteners. It could potentially damage your gut microbiome. You know, you're getting some degree of like precephalic insulin secretion. It might dysregulate your blood sugar. Like right. what's your take on the GI connection to artificial sweeteners? And are there some that are better than others? Yeah, this is something I've changed my mind on over the past few years. So when I wrote Healthy Good Healthy You in 2018, I referenced what was known as the San Antonio Longitudinal Study on Aging. And they did find that increased artificial sweetener consumption directly correlated with increased waist circumference. So that to me was very damning and led me to say, be careful with artificial sweeteners. But more recent meta-analyses, and maybe just taking a step back, what a meta-analysis is, is researchers will look at all of the quality randomized control trials that are looking at an issue, and they'll summarize all of them. The meta-analyses are nice because they're a truth serum, right? Because anyone could find one study that reinforces what they want to think. It's much different if you summarize the 15 studies. It's almost like going to a restaurant, and if you asked one person what they thought of the restaurant, they may have had a good or bad experience that was kind of an outlier. But if you ask 20 people, that's going to give you a much more representative idea of what your experience at that restaurant would be like. So this is akin to a meta-analysis. And a recent meta-analysis did not find any metabolic ill effects from artificial sweeteners. And I think Lane Norton has done some good. And Lane Norton can be a, a little bit abrasive admittedly, but I think he's done some good reviewing of the literature on sweeteners for metabolic health. And we also did check for how those sweeteners impact leaky gut, and we weren't able to locate any convincing data that they are problematic for leaky gut. So I would just say simply trial them. If you notice an aversion, I'm bloated, I have reflux, I have flatulence, I would avoid them. And if you don't notice that, sort of honoring one's body, and what we say in the clinic is your body is boss, if your body seems to handle them okay, then I wouldn't worry about it. What do you do personally with this? Like if, if I gave you a, if I gave you a coffee, if I made a coffee for you at our house, let's assume you drink coffee and I'm like, Hey, I'd like to sweeten it with something. And I had a packet of Splenda. I had some Stevia drops and I had some allulose and I had some xylitol. What would you ask me to put in there? Well, I will say I've noticed that if I overdo allulose, I get loose bowels and there's probably a lot of people out there who notice that. So for some of the artificial sweeteners, because they're a prebiotic, that can be an issue, right? So it does kind of depend on someone's gut type. Uh, so for me, I would probably just opt toward the natural sugar and just do it like a cane sugar um, or maybe stevia. Although I don't really love the taste of stevia personally. So I would probably opt for a little bit of sugar and maybe some cream than anything artificial, including Alilos. Nice. Okay. That's, that's really cool and good to know. How many, how many bowel movements do you, do you recommend people like look for per day? Is there a standardization that we can say with that? Is it completely unique? Like, you know, what, what does good gut health look like? What's the range of experience that people could have 
and what should poop be, look like too? Like what's the range of like what healthy poop generally is like? Right, you're right. I think anywhere from one to three is probably a good aim. Some people may go every other day and I don't think that's a big deal. Uh, some people may just have different transits due to their anatomy, what's going on in their microbiome. I think a North Star that we could aim for as an ideal would be one to three. And then if people want to look up, it's called the Bristol stool chart. You want to be a four, sort of looking like a sausage. You don't want to be loose. You don't want to be hard and compact. And this is important because if people are having, let's say that, that fungal type, looser bowels and diarrhea is a characteristic. And then with bacterial types, they can skew either way. Some people will have constipation. Some people will have diarrhea. So looking at the form of your stool and looking for that torpedo, so to speak, is a good indication that things are working well up the line. Nice. And I'll just add some personal reflection here. When I eat the foods that I know my body loves and processes well, I have ideal bowel movements. They're great multiple times per day. They look Bristol four. They're wonderful. And then when I deviate and eat foods that I know are not great for my particular system, like I have variation. I could have, you know, really sticky, not good poops that are not well formed. I can experience rarely, but some degree of constipation. So for me, the way I've kind of honed into my body is there's a tighter window of foods that I absolutely thrive on. And I've now found joy in participating in those foods. And I'd like to get your take on this. Like that's where I've landed. I've actually like been like, oh, my window's actually tighter. I'm going to just play within this window and find a lot of joy. And then I guess there could be another perspective that's like, oh, actually maybe you have some dysfunction and you should actually like work on correcting things to open up this window to many more things. Like that's a philosophy, I guess. Like, where do you fall? And I guess, like, how do you approach? Do you feel like you have a more specific window like me? Or is there, are you thinking like, man, we should just do everything we can to continuously remodel and architect the gut with probiotics, with different things, so that you can have this massive wide range of things? I think it's both, right? We want to use all the tools reasonably at our disposal to optimize our gut health. Because some of us, like myself, antibiotics as a kid, only breastfed short term. Uh, when I was in high school, had antibiotics again for acne. So I tend to be more of a fungal type. And I have noticed that if I overdo it with the starches, I have a problem and, and the sweets. Um, I can do a lot of the high prebiotic, high fiber foods with no problem. So over time, I've just learned what I can thrive on. Now within that though, I could go out to a dinner and be like, sure, pizza, bring it on, slice of cake at the end, I'll do it. Could I do that five days a week? Definitely not. But I at least have the freedom to do that, you know, when it when it suits me on occasion. So, yeah, we want to use the tools to be as robust and as resilient as we can, but then also honor the feedback that we get from our body in terms of there's probably going to be some limitation, right? I, I tell people, yes, uh, you know, that we work with in the clinic. Can we improve your food tolerance? I think very, very likely yes. Will you be able to go out and have four beers? Mexican food, right, and sweets and feel nothing? Maybe not, right? You know, that may be a little bit too high of an expectation, but I think we get you to a point where you're really quite resilient. The other thing I just want to slip in here really quick is the the perspective that we take because sometimes these gut issues can come with a lot of fear attached to them. In fact, it has been demonstrated that people with IBS have more anxiety. So I think the way the healthcare community handles these conversations is so important. And it's why I get so disheartened when I see some of the, I guess you would call them dietary activists. You know, you can't have sugar, you can't have gluten, you can't have salicylate, you can't have, and it, it just decimates some people. Some people, they don't care, whatever, not a big deal. But for the people who are well-read and a little bit anxious, it can really harm them psychologically if we have a very overzealous perspective on diet. Yeah, I, I see that happen all the time. There's be, you can look at like certain chat forums for, for things and people are so despondent because they're like, I feel like I can eat absolutely nothing. And then everything is bad. And quite frankly, you're shifting your whole system into a stressed, more sympathetic fear-based, you know, state, which is going to just make everything worse. So I hear you on that point. Well made. I only have a few more questions as we, as we wrap this up. One is what is your take on, um, the super high meat, super low carbohydrate diet trend right now? So people eating like carnivore diets with like very little fiber um, whatsoever. 
I look at that as a short-term elimination diet that for some people, that can be quite helpful. For the people who are incredibly food reactive, as a keynote here, short-term extreme elimination diet, almost like taking a low FODMAP diet or a candida diet to an extreme. But I really think it's a mistake to make the claim that this is a healthy diet that people can thrive on. You know, we are omnivorous. If you look at our GI tract and if you look at the anatomy of a carnivore next to an herbivore next to us, we are clearly omnivorous. And this is why I think some of the, the gurus in, in carnivore have been over time allowing a little more carbohydrate to creep into their diet. Because even if you go to a hunter-gatherer perspective, to my knowledge, no hunter-gatherers actively practice a carnivore diet. They ate what they had available. Now, different regions of the world had more or less vegetative matter, but they were all consuming some. So it can be a tool. Uh, I do have some concerns that it's, it's a bit dogmatic in terms of the messaging, and I think that harms some people because they don't then do the most important thing after that that rehab elimination phase, which is trying to broaden their diet. Um, so I would say short term, yes. Long term, I'm a little bit wary of, um, you know, of any deleterious impacts that may have in the long term. Very nice. And and my next question on kind of trend stuff is: there's been a lot of discussion, particularly from the work of Dr. Stephen Gundry, about lectins and the idea of anti-nutrients in foods that wreck our gut lining and lead to inflammation. Uh, and common lectin containing foods might be like beans, legumes, uh, tomatoes, nightshade kind of type things. What's your take on um, being wary about lectin containing foods that have inflammatory stuff? Should be, we, we be scared of like beans? Should we soak in those, avoiding those? Are lectins like as toxic as they're made out to be sometimes in, in the internet? I don't think so. I tend not to agree with Gundry's hypothesis. I do think some of the changes people make when they go on a lower lectin diet lead them to eat less processed foods and healthier foods, and therefore they feel better, and then they'll say, well, it was the lectins. We have fact-checked this. There's not much research. Now, lack of research doesn't mean it's disproven, but I'd also love to see Gundry, with, with as big as an empire he's built, I'd love to see him publish something of merit. And there, he hasn't really published anything. And it could be a simple, you know, 10 people versus 10 people to pit a reference diet against a low lectin diet. So I'm always a little bit wary when someone's built up a large platform on a thing, but they're not publishing any science on that thing. Mm -hmm. And it's more incumbent upon Gundry to do that, in my view, because there's not much science there. So there's really a paucity, there's really a need to have something published. My perspective is for maybe a small, small grouping of people, they're sensitive to lectins. And that's just being really charitable. I think it's more so, let's say some grains are high lectin, some beans are high lectin. Well, guess what? Those are also high FODMAP. So I think it's much yeah. more likely the FODMAP than it is actually the lectins. And I'm happy to be proven wrong there, but as it currently stands, I, I can't say I agree. Nice. Well, this was really informative. I, I, I just want to recognize again, I appreciate your level-headed perspective, evidence-based, obviously deep protocols involved with that. And you just do a great job of simplifying things into these frameworks and categories. Like I realized much like you, I'm a little more of a fungal type and I respond to the carbohydrates. I've had skin fungus as a kid. I took some mm. acne medication. Like it's just interesting. I've, I've gained a lot from this conversation. I'm sure everyone listening as well has. Um, and this is the tip of the iceberg of what you do. You have your website, your podcast, your YouTube channel, your programs, your supplements. So please give us a little primer about where people can connect more, learn about your work, follow up, et cetera. Yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate that. I'm glad it was insightful. It's always fun to nerd out on gut health. Uh, the website is drrusho.com, D-R-R-U-S-C-I-O.com. We have a blog. We have a YouTube and a podcast, a supplement line, and a clinical practice. Plus, I wrote a book a few years back. So there's a lot of resources out there. If people are struggling, I would say don't struggle. I mean, I was struggling for a bit and getting the right help really changed my life. So if this resonates, happy to help you guys in any capacity that we, we possibly could. Well, thanks again for coming on, Dr. Ruscio. We appreciate you and I uh, hope everyone checks out those links that'll also be in the show notes. We'll talk to you very soon. Thank you. Hey there, my friend. 
Thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode of the Fit Mother Project podcast. If you love what you heard, I have a favor to ask you. Please consider taking 60 seconds right now to leave us a rating and review on our podcast. Leaving us a review is super quick. It only takes a minute and it's so, so helpful to us as it really boosts this podcast to reach more people who need this information and this message. If you're listening on Apple Podcast, you can leave us a star rating and review. If you're watching on YouTube, you can hit the like button and leave us a comment. Overall, I truly appreciate you being with us here on the podcast. On behalf of me and my entire Fit Mother Project team, we truly feel honored and grateful to support you and your family on your journey to fantastic health. I thank you for your support of this podcast and of this mission. Also, if you're interested in joining our complete Fit Mother program and becoming an official member of our community, you can visit our website, fitmotherproject.com. And on the Fit Mother site, you'll be able to see our complete Fit Mother program along with our online store with the best supplements designed for busy moms. And you'll also find a ton of free resources like recipes, workouts, meal plans, and more. God bless you and your family. This is Dr. Anthony Balduzzi signing off. I'll catch you on the next episodes of the Fit Mother Project podcast.